grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Christ Jesus our blessed Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The text for our message this morning is the Gospel reading, which was read just a few moments ago. If is there, is there anyone here among us this morning who just loves to pay taxes? I mean, you just cannot wait to get that tax bill and to be able to write that check because it thrills you so much. You're probably familiar with the phrase, there is nothing so certain as death and taxes. Yes, <clears throat> taxes are a part of our life. Whether we like it or not, everywhere we turn, there are taxes. Property tax sales tax, income tax, capital growth tax, death tax, and uh, the litany goes on and on and on. For most people the word tax is a repulsive word. It conjures up negative thoughts and feelings. But tax is nothing new. Even in Bible times they had their taxes. Tax collectors were always associated with the word sinners. Not at all uncommon in the Gospels that you have this phrase, tax collectors and sinners. They formed their own grouping. Questions regarding taxes are in the national spotlight currently. Washington and our representatives there are struggling to devise a new tax code with an attempt <coughs> to reduce the tax burden on businesses, industry, and the general citizenry. We welcome this and we commend them for their effort and we hope and pray that they can accomplish this task responsibly. Now we need to understand that we have to come to our senses and we have to be reasonable people. The question must be asked, can we live without taxes. That would indeed be wonderful. And if that were possible, I'm certain we would all sing hallelujahs if that were accomplished. However, the facts of life are real. The streets, the roads, bridges, parks, teachers, schools, libraries, firemen and women and peace officers, the federal, the state, and local governments. They just automatically happen, don't they? They just all of a sudden pop up, they're there. Nobody has any responsibility for them. That's a childish thought and that is living in a dream world. Somehow all our public services need to be paid for. And you can be absolutely sure that Santa Claus is not going to do it, nor is the Easter Bunny. Let us, let us remove ourselves from this daydream world and become real people 
because we live in a real world. And in this real world, there are taxes, and there will always be taxes. There may be some among us this morning who receive their living from the taxes that the citizens pay. And that is to be expected if they are employed in such services. It is an honorable profession, and it provides a family their daily bread. There's nothing negative about that, and they should not be held in less esteem than anyone of another profession. The payment of taxes is the responsibility, and one should assume a joyful responsibility, which I myself have not come to yet, hopefully in course of time I can, the joyful responsibility of the citizens of the land, whether they make use of the services or not. This is something that is shared equitably by every citizen, based upon certain standards. We may have a difference of opinion of what is equitable, and I am not here to offer the pros and cons of that. On the basis of this gospel text, we pray for the Holy Spirit's guidance to enlighten us that we understand the use of taxes today as well as also in Jesus' day, and what responsibility we as citizens have in regards to that, and what general scripture speaks of relative to our responsibility to authority. This text is recorded in almost identical words in the Gospel of Mark and also in the Gospel of Luke. I emphasize identical words because that is important, because that identity provides authenticity. This event is believed to have taken place on Tuesday of Holy Week. Now there always was since Jesus' birth, you might say, especially during his beginning of his ministry and early in his ministry, there always was that desire among the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, those groups in that day to get rid of this man Jesus because they despised him. He was not one that met their standards. And so they wanted to eliminate him, find fault with him, so that ultimately he could be executed. The coin for which Jesus asked is called the denarius. It is a Roman coin with a value of about a day's wage at that time. On one side was the portrait of Emperor Tiberius, and on the other, the inscription in Latin, Tiberius Augustus, son of divine Augustus. The coin was issued by Caesar and was used by him for, uh, was used to, for paying of taxes to him. And Caesar did with this tax money what he chose to do. And that was a part of the irritation that no one had any authority to tell Caesar how this tax money was to be used. And might I add, that might be the source of irritation among many citizens today in that we feel the use of our tax funds are not always used rightly. That's an opinion. The Pharisees as a group were opposed to Roman rule and the Herodians supported Roman rule and so they were at odds with one another. However, 
in this text and on this condition and situation, those two opposing groups formed an alliance because their mission was singular. And that mission was to find this man in contradiction. The trap that they had set for him so that ultimately they would have cause for his execution. Notice their approach to Jesus. They come with words of flattery. This is what they say. Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. Wow. That's got to make someone feel good. That boosts one's image. That boosts one's ego. And that you teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Nothing wrong with that. It's true. And they are building up Jesus as the great hero. You are not swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. It's all well and good. This is not at all uncommon. It's an approach that is used by we human beings, common citizens, as well as politicians. The common expression that we oft times use is that we are buttering up the opponent. Now after these words of flattery, now they come with the basic question, and that is the heart and core of the text. And that question is, tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? They're asking Jesus for his opinion. The word opinion is somewhat weak. And it seems to indicate that they did not want to push the issue too far. Lest they separate themselves from Jesus totally or that Jesus completely and totally ignores them. They did not ask him, what do you think? Or what do you believe? But simply, what is your opinion? And that could be very flexible. If Jesus had said no to the question, they would have reported that to the governor and he would have been executed for treason. If he said yes, the Pharisees would denounce him to the people as disloyal to the nation. Hence, Jesus asked for a coin. And he used that to answer their question in a very unique fashion. Jesus makes a very clear distinction between Caesar and God. Remember the opening statement of the text. They had plans to trap him in his words. That was their mission. This was, set, this was a set up scheme to get Jesus to contradict himself. Then they could legally charge him. Today, we distinguish between the kingdom on the left and the kingdom on the right. The left is the government and all those who have authority over us. The kingdom on the right is the church. This surely was not the answer they expected, but they had to admit amazement at this man's ability, at his talent and his skill, while at the same time they were disappointed, as our text says. They were amazed, but also disappointed. They did not achieve their goal. They failed in their mission. So we now come to that point where we ask the question, so what? We have read the text, we have expounded the text, now what do we do about it? That is the so what. First, we are to recognize and acknowledge the fact that we possess, we as Christians, possess dual citizenship. We are citizens of our land, we are citizens of the government, but we are also citizens of the church. Only Christians 
are unique in this regard. What does it mean to be a good citizen? That's a question which every Christian ought to ask of themselves. What does it mean? And that's a good Lutheran question, by the way. What does it mean to be a good citizen? And for that we go to the scriptures for the answer. Romans chapter 13, we read, It is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give, every, give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Again, recorded in 1 Timothy chapter 2, we read, I urge then, first of all, that request, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings as all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and honesty, in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. The purpose and function of government, as noted here in this reading, is to provide for its citizens peaceful and quiet lives. That we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. Titus writes in chapter 3, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. And in the epistle of Peter 1, chapter 2, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as a supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong, and to commend those who do right. Now, did you notice that in none of these passages did it allow you or anyone else to dishonor your government, or anyone in authority, if you do not agree with them, or if you do not dislike them. I see no way in these texts where one can say, oh yes, this gives me the right to dishonor. Violent protests appear to have become the norm to register disagreement or dislike. And this certainly is not the Christian mode of life. Christian citizens are responsive to the passages read. Here is where we, you and I, at the ground roots level, here is where we as Christians must muster the courage and determination and discipline to model our Christian faith and life. Model it. Show it off. Don't be ashamed of it. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We are the leaven of the lump. My goodness, should not things be different? How salty is your salt? How bright is your light? How strong is your leaven? Sadly, far too often, we who are to be the light of the world, the salt, the leaven, we run and hide. We run and hide. Nobody loves to pay taxes, but we do it out of necessity. 
sometimes grudgingly because we know the consequences if we don't there is the power of the law and the law is extremely powerful that power of the law hangs over our head constantly Jesus Jesus loved to be obedient to his heavenly father that was his authority as a human being as Abraham laid his son on the altar so the father places his lamb Jesus on the altar of the cross there Jesus bore the entire wrath of his father all that the wrath that the God the Father could pour out on him he was condemned he was forsaken he was smitten he was despised he was rejected there Jesus carried the sin of the entire world past present and future after the hours of torture and suffering the father was finally satisfied with the price that Jesus paid that Jesus could finally declare there from the cross it is finished it is finished the battle has been won what does that mean for you and me that means that Jesus bought your ticket and my ticket into heaven he gives gives it to us it is a free gift that we possess we should never abuse this free gift we should never take this free gift for granted we should never assume that we are entitled to this free gift but we should use it wisely confess it publicly and live it freely and generously as the redeemed sanctified edified children of God if you have not yet cultivated the desire to love to pay taxes and neither have I but prayerfully I hope to come to that as we look at scripture scripture would encourage us to develop that attitude scripture would encourage us to develop that attitude and it is achievable the Holy Spirit and only the Holy Spirit can convince us that God wills it we pay our taxes because God wills it and so we can pay our taxes joyfully and lovingly amen and now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus unto life everlasting amen Thank you.